Welcome to View from the C-Suite, where we have candid conversations with female executives about key business challenges, career advice, and more. This series is brought to you by Wong Duty, the Global Experience and Design Unit for Infosys. I'm Skylar Matson, your host and president of Wong Duty. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our global audience tuning in. Welcome to the fifth episode of View from the C-Suite Women Leaders in Conversation. I'm Skylar Matson, President of Wall Duty, the Global Experience and Design Unit for Emphasis. Today, I am joining you from our Seattle studio. I'm usually in Los Angeles doing these webinars, but that means I got on an airplane to be here. I hugged my colleagues. And the fact that I could do that is relevant to what we're talking about today, healthcare. I mean, what a year for our first responders. We are so grateful to you. And what a year for the teams working behind the scenes to accelerate digital tools and to really reimagine human experience in healthcare. I cannot wait to dive into this topic, but before I do, Quick reminder to our amazing audience, you are always so engaged. We love your questions and you can input them just down at the bottom uh, in the Zoom function anytime throughout the conversation. We'll leave about 15 minutes at the end. And you can also join us on Twitter. Uh, We love seeing your posts about the content. If you use the hashtag women in power, that will allow us to locate your tweets and respond to them and continue the conversation. So now on to our guests. I am so honored to introduce both of these women. The first is Maya Gray, VP of Customer Experience and Engagement at Pfizer, where she's creating the next generation of experiences for patients, healthcare professionals, partners, and her Pfizer colleagues, many stakeholders for Maya. She has 20 years of experience in healthcare and medical technology. She also worked in technology consulting with Accenture, and she holds two very impressive degrees, a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering and a Master of Science in Engineering, Economic Systems, and Operations Research from Stanford University. Had never heard of that one. (laughs) Wow, Maya. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much for having me, Skylar. I appreciate it. I'm also honored to introduce Lisa Davis, the CIO of Blue Shield of California. With over 20 years of experience, Lisa is leading efforts to modernize healthcare with new technologies. She earned her Bachelor of Science in Computer Engineering from Syracuse University, also has a Master of Science degree in Human Resources Management. Lisa has received numerous industry recognitions, including the CIO 100 Award from CIO Magazine, And this one's really cool, the Digital Edge Award for Innovative Use of Technology to Deliver Business Value. So glad to welcome you, Lisa. Thank you, Skylar. So happy to be here. So let's start by setting the context. I mean, certainly all workers in many industries had to adjust the way they work because of the pandemic. But uh, this is especially true in the healthcare industry. And of course, doctors and nurses and our frontline healthcare workers were significantly impacted. But the shift to digital tools, it was so dramatic and it was so fast that Lisa and Maya, your responsibilities were significantly impacted too. Uh, McKinsey reported that the use of telehealth was 78 times greater in April of 2020 than February of 2020 in two months. That is such that is such a massive spike. And now from what I'm reading, and you will certainly tell us more about this, uh, things are starting to level out a little bit. Uh, Harvard Business Review said that many solutions at the start of the pandemic acted as these temporary quick bridges. Uh, and the key challenge moving forward is to make sure that those bridges are permanent, that they are as solid and as beneficial as they can be. So Lisa, let's dive in. You started started at Blue Shield in February of 2020. So wow, not only was your industry crazy impacted, you were coming into a new position at the start of the pandemic. Can you talk about how you went about building some of those very first technical solutions and how 
you're making sure they're solid enough to keep building on over time. Yeah, absolutely, Skylar. You know, I joined Blue Shield, Blue Shield of California uh, two weeks before we had to mobilize our entire workforce, about 7,000 people, to work from home. So I think many of us had the experience of joining companies uh, which have all been virtual, a virtual ramp into new new organizations, which brings a different level of engagement, requires a different level of engagement, but also introduces, you know, complexities that you probably wouldn't have normally have faced if we were still face to face and, you know, if we, you know, whatever the normal was of how we were doing business. So within those two weeks, you know, we mobilized the entire workforce. That includes all our call center personnel. I think most people thought it couldn't be done, but we, you know, the team did an amazing job in doing it over a four-day weekend. And, you know, the the stigma that I, you know, I think is so interesting that we learned from this was everyone thought being virtual that you wouldn't be as productive, that, you know, MPS scores would decline um, and we would impact operations or productivity or the experience that we were providing to our members and providers. And in fact, just the opposite occurred. I think many of us have had the experience that we were actually more productive. Certainly those of us working from home, it feels like it was just one long day. Was there ever a break between working at home, being at home and, and being in the office when your office was now um, in your home? So there was an incredible, um, I think, appetite. And what the pandemic taught us, like you were mentioning in Telehealth, Skylar, is first of all, um, our consumers demanded digital tools and ways to engage. They adopt it. Uh, the use of those tools, and such as telehealth, we doubled in telehealth over over the pandemic. So to provide those type of digital tools and technologies, first it starts with, I think, inside. You know, many of the back-end processes that occur within organizations actually impact and affect what happens as you engage with your customers and your members. So part of the work that we began doing was creating and driving digital transformation, 100% digital, automation of backend processes, simplification of how we do work so that on the front end, our customers, our members, our providers would experience a more seamless, cohesive um, engagement with Blue Shield of California. So that started immediately. But to your point, the pace accelerated. The beauty was digital transformation was kind of thrusted to the forefront in the healthcare industry, which was fantastic because all of us, instead of slowing down and saying, well, let's just kind of take it easy, understand what we did was the opposite. We accelerated efforts, both internal from a digital transformation standpoint and external of how we engage with our providers and members. We did many different pilots um, out in the market because we believe that a healthcare system and how we reimagine healthcare is about being holistic, personalized, and high tech and high touch. So what were those examples of how we could engage our members and providers along those three pillars? One example of the work we did is our efforts around real-time claims. Imagine that we go to the doctor's office, and just like we're checking out of a grocery store, when I leave the doctor's office, I understand what I'm paying for. I understand what I've been charged for. The provider gets paid. The member can make settlement on that payment. This is a process that takes days, and many times we get those Um, the mail, and we can't even understand and read what the heck I went to the doctor for and what I'm paying for. We've done now pilots with many providers in a hospital system where we can do a real-time claim settlement in 11 seconds. So these are examples of digital tools and capabilities other than telehealth that during the pandemic we've been working on. So to your point, we can root these new digital practices into how we do healthcare. Wow, thank you for all that information. You know, I hadn't thought about digital tools enabling more transparency, yes. which the, the 
idea of understanding what you're paying for and how much it's going to cost and like right away is so necessary and I think is going to increase a level of of trust that customers have with their healthcare providers, with their insurance providers, uh, which is which is fantastic, which is really great. So Maya, you were in a similar situation joining Pfizer at this the start of the pandemic. And I'm sure that had its its challenges as well. And your team is responsible for customer experience. And when we talk about your customers, it's not just customers, right? It's it's providers, it's colleagues. You have so many different stakeholders. So I'm interested in how you built some of those early digital bridges with so many different stakeholders involved. Yeah. And, and to be fair, I, I wasn't at Pfizer at the very start of the pandemic. I actually joined during the pandemic, uh, which brings its own challenges, but certainly has been rewarding. I mean, similar to what Lisa shared, um, I know the stories um, and I know what happened over a year ago when the pandemic hit. Uh, and we had to bring tens of thousands of colleagues and contractors online remotely uh, and enable them to service our customers, um, you know, virtually overnight. So it was a heavy lift um, to get us there and to keep us there over the past couple of years. And I think that, you know, when we look at kind of how the world, there's no post COVID, it's just like, now, right? Everyone says pre or post. Um, uh, how do we sustain that? Um, and how do we go back into kind of a hybrid model where not only are our colleagues in person and virtual, but we also have customers, uh, providers that we need to, to service and to provide with answers uh, virtually and in person as well. Um, the team the team has been working to make sure that as, as the world evolves, we evolve as well. Um, and it's not just within Pfizer Digital. My team is a part of Pfizer Digital um, and we have colleagues across Pfizer Digital that we, we work shoulder to shoulder with, uh, but we also partner very, very heavily with our commercial business, our Pfizer Biopharma um, group and um, in designing kind of new solutions and experiences for patients and providers. And we enable that through colleague experiences. So that's why we all also cover colleague experiences. And how are you getting input on what the customer needs or what your colleagues need? Are you regularly doing research, looking at data? What informs those decisions that you make? That's a great question. So one of the teams, uh, we call them capabilities, that reports up to me is our research and insights group. And we actually do, right now it's annual research, um, and it's both qualitative and quantitative research that we do to really look at um, the provider experience as well as the patient experience, understand what their needs are and their pain points, and really what their mindsets are. And we don't just look within the pharmaceutical industry, we look beyond that, uh, because certainly pharma is relevant, but also the broader health healthcare ecosystem. And then we also look at best in class experiences beyond healthcare and life sciences. So I'm a big fan of Delta. My team knows, um, uh, you know, what do they do to really provide an excellent customer experience? What does Amazon do? I mean, Lisa touched on that. Like we, we don't have different expectations as patients and all of us have, or will be patients at some point in our lives. Um, we don't have different expectations of healthcare or pharma because we certainly are a patient and not a consumer. Um, and providers are the same way, right? So they want the same access and ease of use and ease of access to information uh, as a provider as they are a consumer. So we're working on developing experiences that really are able to parallel what they're experiencing in their everyday life. We talk about that a lot at Wong Duty. We say we're a human experience company. We put the human at the center of what we do. And you're absolutely right. If it's a B2B experience, that doesn't mean you don't want it to be as seamless as checking in for your Delta flight on your phone or watching something new on Netflix or ordering DoorDash. I mean, the expectations because of so many amazing companies coming out who are putting customers at the center really mean that in every industry, customer experience has to be at, at the heart of what we do. And you know, sometimes there's some tension because we talk a lot about digital tools and how do you keep the, the human touch at the center when we're moving to more digital tools? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting question, Skylar, because, you know, this consumerization, we have an expectation as consumers, and I love how Maya touched on this as well. It's, it's 
you know, all of us can have personal experiences when it comes to healthcare, whether it's ourselves, whether it's a family member or a friend, how you, why is it that our engagement in healthcare, it's been acceptable to be almost substandard than an expectation that I have in retail, in the airlines industry, um, ordering food, you know, it, it is, that's, you know, I think from the pandemic standpoint and then now the use of digital tools because we were forced to do that, the expectation from consumers now, well, wait a minute, I should have, I need the same expectation if I'm on a real retail site as I'm on my healthcare site. You know, where would I use my digital app for my healthcare company uh, in terms of getting services? Um, maybe I have diabetes. How can I check on my diabetes? You know, we believe, you know, with when I was mentioning healthcare being holistic and personalized, that's the experience that we're trying to create. How does my healthcare company, my providers, my insurer, sure, understand what's happening to me? How can I leverage services and capabilities for wellness? Uh, well-being, preventative care. So it's about the holistic health versus a focus on sick care. So our focus has been about sick care and not about health care. And the beauty of digital tools is we bring um, those capabilities front and center to have a more personalized experience with our members so that I find benefits out of engaging with my healthcare company and my providers. Now, keeping that human touch in there, you know, that's where the innovation, that's where pilots, um, a lot of the research that Maya has talked about is, where do you find that perfect balance between digital tools, keeping the human experience, and making sure that what we design and what we deploy, our members are at the very center. Yeah. And, you know, you think about your personal experiences when you go to the doctor and knowing you have so many different stakeholders, you know, providers want the overhead to be lower. Electronic record keeping is helpful. As a patient, I want my doctor to look me in the eye, not be staring down at the computer. I mean, how do you deal with those types of tensions? Yeah, well, the provider tools are just as important. So a great example is a pilot we've done with an, with an Apple Watch. So imagine you're in the doctor's office and this, these had great results where the doctor, uh, the notes are being captured and automatically downloaded to an electronic patient record. So the provider has more time to spend with you as the patient versus scribbling down all the notes and all the overhead that it requires for our doctors to catch up on paperwork. How do we digitize that? How do we leverage tools to ultimately make that easy, easier? So that's one example of how we're trying to improve the provider experience um, to reduce that overhead so that they have more time to spend with patients as well as improve the member experience. But I think one of the things that you've hit on that we have tremendous work that still needs to be done is around data sharing and data interoperability. You know, in, in California, we believe that a health information exchange should be a place to keep the longitudinal patient record, electronic health record. Imagine going into the doctors where everyone's looking at the same information versus going to doctors that don't have a holistic view of what your particular health is. So we're trying to build with tech partners, um, what, you know, in terms of a data platform, imagine a transparency of data between a member, the patient, a provider, and your insurer, where we all have the same view of the data. And we can all make decisions that ultimately improve health outcomes, but also improve that member and provider experience. That's just fantastic. I'm thinking of how low the bar has been for us in healthcare, where, I mean, this is a huge innovation and something I'm thinking, wow, we, we so need this. And it's great that we're finally moving in that direction, even if it took a global pandemic to force us with all of this rapid yeah. digital acceleration. Maya, what about you at Pfizer Digital? How are you keeping that human touch, that human in mind as you're moving to more digital tools? 
So where we start, um, where the customer experience team starts is always to empathize with the patient or the provider, whatever whatever customer we're designing an experience with, and then leverage that research um, that, that I mentioned earlier to really understand the pain points and design experiences specifically to address those pain points, right? So there are things that would help Pfizer that may not necessarily help a patient or a provider. That's not where we want to focus our efforts. We definitely want to focus kind of um, on on some issues that providers have shared with us. So Lisa mentioned kind of saving time and making their practice more efficient. We recently did a user study where the provider was like, look, what we need from you is to help us save time. So <laughs> how can you help us save time? Uh, if that's providing more beneficial information, answers to common questions about me- our medications and therapies at the point of care, that's what they want. I think, you know, one thing that Lisa spoke about kind of just kind of general interoperability and, and availability of data within healthcare. I mean, I, I was at Shortstrips for several years and interoperability has been kind of a passion of mine uh, for quite some time. And uh, it is a, it's, it's amazing how difficult it is, given how easy it is for data to be exchanged in, in theory, how easy it is for data to be exchanged just technically and, um, and just organizationally how we've created these barriers to share data to really help patients. So at Pfizer, we're also looking at how we can gain access to data, obviously, legally and compliantly to help with patient care and really to understand the patient's journey uh, through our medication. And with so many different disciplines reporting to you, I mean, you've mentioned research, you have CX strategy, uh, you have measurement, certainly, digital activation. How do you ensure that these different teams are all working toward a common goal and they're working together effectively when they, they have such different roles? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And, you know, one reason I joined Pfizer is because of our purpose uh, to create breakthroughs that change patients' lives. So it's not really that difficult, obviously, to rally a team around that purpose. Um, it's, it's our North Star. Uh, with my team, we have uh, five different capabilities um, that report up through me, and they all have different expertise. But what we've seen, the power of CX is when they work together and are able to deliver on ex- an experience from end to end from that research through strategy, through a design, um, and also through a a digital activation and then measurement on the back end. Um, When I joined, actually, the team was only about a year and a half old. Uh, So we had a lot of opportunity to look at kind of what our operating model was and how we could better work with internal customers to deliver for um, our external customers, our patients and providers. Um, We had a lot of hard conversations. And really, <laughs> and, and, and spent a ton of time just uh, hashing through the details. And, and the devil is always in the details, right? Um, and I, you know, I admire my team. They're hugely creative, uh, and and they were very patient with me. Pfizer is a big organization, and there's a lot to learn when you come on board. Uh, but we've we've had an amazing journey together so far, and we still have a lot of work to do to make sure we're optimizing um, experiences for patients and providers and in our colleagues. Look, sometimes hard conversations are necessary to move things forward, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Correct. <laughs> We're moving quickly. We just need to get through things, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lisa, what changes have you seen in terms of roles and responsibilities as everyone is moving so quickly? Did did different disciplines work together that weren't working together before? Did you change up uh, a process that that has worked great that you really want to take moving forward? Yeah, I think first, first, what needed to happen in in healthcare, and this is very common in terms of the role that your technology organization or your data and analytics organization plays. So we were traditionally what I would call a, a service provider. The job of IT was to keep the lights on, keep the systems running, keep you know keep things up, uh, et cetera. And one of the first things we did was transform our operating model to be a portfolio and product-based model. So that required IT and my team to really pivot into becoming a strategic business partner, side-by-side working with our business partners to understand the challenges as well as the opportunities we had and where technology or data and analytics could be applied. So we shifted the organization to align to 
um, lines of business, as well as key horizontal functions. And we've created customer facing teams with integrated data and analytics to support our business partners. That was step number one. Step number two was looking across the entire suite of our enterprise architecture tools and where can we simplify and rationalize? Kind of back to that point of how we address and digitize and automate back end processes has a direct impact on the front end experience that our providers and our members receive from us. So looking at platform simplification, where can we change and pivot our thinking <clears throat> from project-based to product-based? And how do I deliver a holistic product life cycle in terms of the capabilities and services that we ultimately want to bring to market and share with our members and providers? The beauty of that is it basically completely shifted how IT was viewed. You know, one of the great quotes that our COO says, it would be great when I don't know the difference between an IT person and a business person because they're one and the same. So establishing that trust, building business acumen, having our business partners learn more and understand IT acumen and data and analytics, and then working together uh, in terms of how we're building capabilities or services that we want to bring to market. The beauty of that, as is kind of my last point, is integration. You know, Maya talked about all of the teams. How do we keep everybody working towards the same purpose, same North Star? Well, our North Star at Blue Shield is to create a healthcare system that is worthy of our family and friends and sustainably affordable. That mission binds us together. Now that we're integrated and aligned with the business, we can look at those. <clears throat> um, across the enterprise to drive better integration, more seamless connection and experience that ultimately we provide for our members and providers. But it's a constant engagement. You know, one, you know, everybody knows in their organizations, one business unit will be going to do X, somebody else will be doing Y. And what I love about the role of technology is that we're the glue that connects it together. And we can leverage then technology to enable those business outcomes. Technology is the glue that connects it together and now more than ever. And I think the elevation of IT, of technology as a business partner and yeah. being at the table as those business decisions are being made and understanding the impact that technology has on the business is where is where every industry is heading. I do want to shift a little bit because you are both such exceptional leaders. And I know there are a lot of women who join who want to hear from you about your career advice and your your personal journeys. So Maya, I'd like to start with you and let's look back to your 30 year old self. What, what do you know now that uh, you wish she knew? Um, I would say, you know, don't be afraid of change uh, and also really maintaining connections and personal connections with people is so, so important. Like not just looking for career advice, but personal advice and growth. Um, I've done a lot better at that as my non 30 year old self <laughs> than I did in my thirties, but I, I do treasure the relationships I was able to foster and develop throughout my thirties as well. So I would say people don't do that enough. Um, and I, I, when I think about kind of even my time at Pfizer, um, what's been critical and key to my success is, is just connecting with my colleagues. And as, as difficult as it may seem that it would be in a virtual space, you just set up 15 minute coffee chats um, and you can do that with anyone or a 15 minute phone call just to catch up and see how people are doing and, and, and get advice. So, and always ask for advice and, and listen to it <laughs> is what I would say too. <laughs> listen, yeah, listen to it's key, right? I yeah. think that is so important. One of our values at Wong Duty is relationships first. And it's relationships with your colleagues. It is relationships with your clients, with your customers. It's the relationships that you grow in your own personal network. And that is really the key, I think, to both career success and happiness when you lean in to those relationships. I think that's such great advice. I wonder too, Maya, as a woman of color, if you have any advice for other women of color. 
Absolutely. Um, where I've done well is, is when I've been myself, right? So I would say be authentic uh, and be true to yourself because people can see if you're not being true to yourself um, and, and you know, take advantage of the fact that DEI is trending. Um, it, it, it brings more opportunities uh, and you leverage that with your expertise and your skills uh, and, and you'll do well. Um, but definitely just be true to yourself. Be true to yourself. True for all of us. Okay, Lisa, your 30-year-old self. My th- what do you mean? I'm, I'm still 30. <laughs> I know okay. it was um, last year. Was I was like, Maya, year. what is she saying? We're not 30 anymore. Um, no, I love Maya's uh, comments. I mean, um, I think as, as certainly as women, you know, the networking piece, a lot of people are like, oh, why do I have to do this networking piece? Um but if you if you look at that networking piece as an opportunity to build relationships and make con- connections, then um, I think your approach is you know much differently. And those connections, and this is the beauty of social media, frankly, you can keep. I have connections back to my very first jobs coming out of college because of the power of social media and the ability to keep those connections or reconnect. So the power of networking, start immediately while you're going to school, build that network. And I think of networks in you know, almost three different tiers, an operational network where you engage with folks day to day to get your job done and those relationships are so critical. Um, we then have um, a development network of opportunities. I love how Maya said, if you want to learn something, set up a coffee chat, set up a one-on-one with something and say, really, I'd love to learn more about this. Can you tell me what what you do Um, and how that could be applicable to possibly growing your career? And then there's a strategic network I like to think about of where do I want to be five to 10 years out? So um, I think the power of that networking, the power of building relationships cannot be um, underestimate it. The, the other thing is um, I've learned that through the greatest risk comes the greatest reward. And that's where the greatest opportunities for learning are. And women are notorious as when looking at a job um, description of checking off, well, I don't do that. Okay, I do this. And if I don't have everything checked off, then I don't apply for the role apply, take more risk, right? Because that's when the greatest opportunities for growth and learning occur. And that's how you can really move and develop your career. Fantastic. Fantastic advice. I was, you know, jotting down some notes myself. (laughs) Continuous learning, another value. So (laughs) I have been peeking over at this Q&A and there are a lot of great questions from our audience. So I am going to, I'm going to start throwing some your way from our fantastic uh, viewers here. Um, I'm going to start with a a great question from Amanda. Um, Now that the pace of digital transformation has slowed down a bit from the onset of the pandemic, what are the long-term digital goals for your organization? And, and are they determined by consumer experience or product need? Hmm. I, I don't think we've slowed down. So no. <laughs> uh, I, I, I think if you asked any member of my team, they're like, can we slow down? But um, that pace has certainly not slowed um, since the pandemic. And I, I think there is, we're all driven by that mission and we, we, know that healthcare needs to be reimagined. And this is why we think about healthcare around that holistic, personalized, high tech and high touch. So we're going full speed ahead um, in terms of transforming that healthcare um, experience. Long term, you know, what we're building over the next couple of years is what we refer to as an experience cube. And that experience cube is essentially a data platform in the cloud. So we're moving our infrastructure to now be cloud-based so that we have more agility and more scalability in terms of the services and and partners and capabilities that we can provide. But the long state is around that data sharing and interoperability, where I can go into any doctor in my particular network and I have a sharing of information between that doctor, between me as the patient, and between my insurer, so that ultimately 
I can be invested in my own health. It's more personalized and catered to my particular needs. It's a holistic view. We know that your environment, 80% affects your health, where 20% is your genetics. So that longitudinal patient view of uh, social determinants of health, um, wellness, the environment that I live in, my nutrition, all of those are key components of what makes me, Lisa, Maya, or Skyla, who we are from a health standpoint. So our end goal is to improve that member provider experience, drive data sharing and interoperability so that ultimately we can reduce the cost of health care and improve health outcomes. Amanda, what did you think of that? <laughs> um, here's one uh, for Maya. Uh, you've, you've both named some strong ways that your, your companies are improving customer experience. Um, but Maya, where do you think the healthcare industry has the greatest opportunity to innovate in the next few years? And Kinley, thank you for that question. That's a, hmm. Um, I think that really looking at how we can leverage technology um, aggressively <laughs> uh, beyond and, and, and really pushing the limits uh, and, and looking at what's done outside of healthcare. I mentioned this earlier, like we, there's so many novel technologies that are utilized outside of healthcare that we could leverage within healthcare to really drive the patient experience and patient outcomes. And I don't think we're doing enough of that yet. Um, and part of that is because obviously in healthcare, we have HIPAA, we have legal and, and regulatory um, barriers, but I think we also have to look at how we push the limits there um, and, and really focus on what's best for the patient and what outcomes we can impact. So that's what I would say. I have, I have a, another follow-up question for you, Maya, because I think they might be somewhat related. This is from Jess. Jess, this is a great question. Uh, she says, Maya, I love what you shared about qual and quant insights, both the qualitative and the quantitative research. How do you guide balancing transformation with ensuring the research is statistically significant? So I would say, um, one, we, we do a lot of work as we develop our research studies, um, and we look at kind of both across our brands and across different uh, therapeutic areas where we need to focus our efforts. Um, and we get a, a sizable enough sample so that uh, the, the insights we gather are, 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 are things that we can leverage within our business. Um, and then just we take that information in, internally and discuss it and really figure out kind of what insights we can use to develop new experiences. And, and we collaborate heavily with the business um, and our digital partners to understand kind of, all right, this is this is what we have. Um, and they won't necessarily be digital insights, right? It's, it's really about what the customer needs based on what the customer needs. How do we how do we transition kind of an idea or a pain point into an experience that that addresses that pain point? Great. Here's a question from Rick, and I'm going to throw this your way, Lisa. Um, considering the digital transformation initiatives mentioned, it takes a tremendous collaboration between your IT org and the business units they support. We were talking about this. Can you talk about the challenges of matching IT KPIs and business KPIs so that the innovation can be accelerated? It's a great question. Yeah, I, I would say, uh, no, I appreciate that question. I think IT KPI should be about business outcomes. We have a tendency in IT to use standard, I would call them operational metrics, um, system availability. Um, I'm just going to make some, you know, number of cyber breaches, um, number of incident reports, et cetera. Well, are, if we are connected in terms of driving results and business outcomes, then we should be as IT vested into the business outcomes. So um, those day-to-day -day operational metrics are important, frankly, for IT to make sure we're doing the basics and that's all about operational excellence. But what your business partners care about is one, you're delivering on those basics. So that's running water, a no-brainer but that you're vested in driving the business results and outcomes that they're striving for. 
Thank you. I can just add to that. One thing we also do beyond kind of looking at business metrics, because business tends to focus also on kind of the number of clicks. If if you look at a website or the number of visits, we layer on top of that experience metrics and really look at kind of the value that we're adding from a customer perspective. And I'm I'm sure Lisa and Lupox as well. We do. We look at MPS scores. We look at that member experience and try to make those decisions on around what are the business results that we're going for all around how that ultimately affects our member and provider experience. Absolutely. Here's another great question. I want you both to answer this. It's a bit of a two-parter. Uh, of all the leadership positions you've held, which was the most challenging and why? And, and which one was the most fulfilling? That's a hard question um, because they're all so different. Um, and, you know, I'll, I'll just go ahead and start. You know, when I came out of college, um, computer engineering, I started as a high school intern for the federal government. So um, my first, my first career, my first journey was really um, in the Department of Defense. Now, what was probably challenging about that, but at the same time fulfilling, is that I was a young woman. I was usually the only woman in the room. Um, It taught me how to really um, build my own self-confidence in terms of being an active participant in the room. And, And many times I get the question, well, how do you do that? And I think it becomes getting really good at what you do, your trade craft, uh, what you're hired to do. And then at the end of the day, you ultimately have to deliver results so that you're driving an impact. And you got to be able to communicate um, not only your expertise, but what those results are. And the more you do it, the easier it gets. Um, So that was a great learning experience. And to kind of to my point earlier, when you take those risks and you step out of your comfort zone is usually when you're going to find the greatest learning and the greatest rewards by doing so. Interesting enough, you know, as I left DOD and I went to academia and then I went to high tech, I was still the only woman in the room for, for the most part. But one of the risks that I did take is while I was at Intel, I left the IT side and I went over to run a P&L in the data center group. So I ran a business for enterprise and government. I was terrified. They spoke a whole new language that I didn't even know um, uh, on the data center group side. But I look back on that experience of three and a half years and I grew and learned so much. I really believe that it ultimately made me a better CIO as I stepped into healthcare. So I think you each of those opportunities um, they're all different. They were all challenging. I think anytime you start a new job, if it's not a little bit challenging, then maybe you're not pushing yourself enough, right? Because there, there should be a little bit of, wow, I got a lot to learn, just like I did when I came into healthcare. I got a lot to learn, and I'm still learning about the healthcare sector and the healthcare industry and how to apply technology solutions to create and transform ultimately the healthcare system. Thank you. Maya, most challenging, most fulfilling, one in the same. Yeah, I would say um, uh, prior to Pfizer, um, I worked for um, a medical neurotechnology device company called BrainScope. Um, and I actually was brought on the BrainScope to help with the commercialization effort and initially was responsible for customer experience and operations. Um, but through a series of interesting events. <laughs> um, uh, the CEO said, Maya, you have two degrees in engineering. Why don't you manage the engineering team too? Uh, and I've, I've never been responsible for engineers. Um, even though I do have these engineering degrees, I haven't done engineering since I was in school. Um, so I had uh, the, the amazing opportunity uh, to work very closely with the developers um, as well as the, I was responsible for engineering, manufacturing, UI, UX, um, program management, and customer experience and operations, uh, what I came there to do. So that was probably the most challenging just because, uh, you know, although I've worked side by side with engineers uh, pretty much my entire career, I've never been responsible for managing them um, and leading them. And I, I wasn't the direct manager, but um, definitely it, it was a different perspective and a different challenge from a work 
perspective. Um, and as far as fulfilling at that same uh, company, um, our CEO uh, was a woman um, and we had an all female uh, executive team. So that was probably one of the most rewarding. I don't know that that will ever happen again uh, to me, but it was definitely a rewarding experience uh, just working alongside a group of intelligent and, and incredibly talented women uh, was, was incredibly rewarding for me. I bet that sounds phenomenal. That yeah. really does. I am watching the clock and I am sad that it has been moving. Like it seemed to move faster than normal time because this conversation was so engaging, but I do want to wrap on time. I'm sorry for everybody's questions that we couldn't get to because there are some really good ones in here. Maya and Lisa, thank you so much for your time, for your wisdom, your inspiration. I think it's so fascinating to hear about the transformation that's happened in healthcare and what's to come. And I sometimes talk about superpowers for good. And it is so clear that you are both using your superpowers for good. And I think all of us listening are grateful that you two are in power at these really important companies right now. Um, to our audience, as always, thank you so much for your insightful questions, for joining us today, for supporting View from the C-Suite. Uh, that is a wrap on episode five, View from the C-Suite, Women Leaders in Conversation. And I so hope you will join me next month when the conversation continues. Thanks, everyone. To find out more about Wong Duty's work transforming businesses through human experience, go to wongduty.com. If you're a woman in the C-suite and would like to be a guest on this show, please reach out to me at womenleaders at wongduty.com.